two years ago, I was in an outpatient program for substance abuse. I had spent a year of undergrad under the guise of experimentation, hanging out with a bad crowd of people and getting high before or after most classes, self-harming and hurting the people I cared about most. I was obviously depressed. I couldn't live with the bad decisions I had made in the past, and I sought an escape. Desperate for fulfillment in the form of cheap thrills. Well, not cheap thrills. Drugs are fucking expensive. More cheap in the sense that... At the end of the day, they aren't worth much. You put stock in using these things because reality is too hard, too painful to live in. Numbing yourself to that pain is easier. Finding an escape from the reality you scorn for the sake of making it through another day. Drugs, sadly, are fun. They're hard to kick, especially when the people around you are actively encouraging your usage giving you access to a world of pills and powders you only heard of on television or through Cheech and Chong specials. Once you fall down that rabbit hole, Wonderland's hard to escape from. And the people you're trapped there with aren't the kind of people you'd usually confide in. I luckily still had people in my corner, real friendships that lifted me up and told me life was still worth living. A family that pushed me to be better. A support group that validated my experiences, told me I could change if I put in the work. So I did. I'm not 100% sober, but I haven't touched hard drugs since. My story isn't unique. It isn't even the most extreme. It's one of many in a tapestry of addiction, a problem with no end in sight due to a growing opioid epidemic. And if there's one thing I want to make sure gets through your head listening to this is that there is no cure to addiction. It's a constant work in progress, just like yourself. Powering through your own urges on a day-to-day -day basis. Proving to yourself that you can do this. You can live your life without this crutch. I've proven that to myself, but for some people it's a lot harder. When you're in that state of mind, why bother changing? Things are fine the way they are. If you were stuck dealing with the pain of a world that doesn't care about you, wouldn't you want this high to last forever? Meg, Mog, and Owl are a long-running series of comics written and drawn by Tasmanian cartoonist Simon Hanselman. Hanselman grew up in an odd and almost tragic household in a fairly bigoted part of the world. He was born and raised in Launceston, with an absent motorbiker father, a schizophrenic grandmother, a hard-working but drug-addicted mother, and a close family friend, Mark Chopper Reed, a literal serial killer. His friendships were fairly normal despite getting into alcohol and weed pretty early on in life, becoming obsessed with cartoons like Rocco's Modern Life and comics like Dan Clow's Ghost World or Love and Rockets. Using comics as an escape from the chaos of his home life, his own gender dysphoria, and the bullying he faced at school, he would start selling zines at a young age to moderate success. After devoting a large amount of his adolescent life to his craft and to mass media consumption, he would drop out of high school around the age of 15 due to his school penalizing him for selling zines on school grounds. After going back and almost immediately dropping out again, Hanselman would devote themselves to comics as they experimented with cross-dressing and gender exploration. He would inevitably move to Hobart to be with some comics associates and became involved in both their local comic scene as well as their punk music scene. He would take part in plenty of free zine fairs as he worked on his graphic novel Girl Mountain, a semi-biographical slice of life story that explored a cross-dressing Australian and their fucked up family. However, after taking part in an art exhibition in 2008, his plans on what he would draw started to change. Making a parody of the 70s British children's series Megan Mogg, Hanselman would eventually develop this side project of his into his main focus after losing more and more interest in Girl Mountain's concept. Basing it primarily on the sitcoms he watched and claims partially raised him growing up, Hanselman would explore both absurd and disturbing subject matter with a comedic grace not seen often. Using both his upbringing in Launceston and adult life in Hobart as inspiration, Hanselman's work on Megan Mogg evolved from simply a stoner slice-of-life comedy into a depressing and sometimes heartbreaking character study, one that treats the terrible decisions its characters make with the weight they deserve, and the consequences of which ripple throughout its non-linear story. Meg and Mog is about, well, Meg, and Mog, and Owl, and Werewolf Jones, and sometimes Booger and Mike. Let me start over. Meg and Mog is about a 29-year-old high school dropout and general depressive Meg, a witch that lives on welfare that still financially supports their meth-addicted mother. She lives in an apartment with her male manipulator musician boyfriend, Mog. 
a cat. Like, not a cat person, a literal cat, who she does have sex with on panel throughout the comic. But eventually stops due to, well, other things. These two high school sweethearts live with their friend and perpetual third wheel, Owl. Who, being in the same toxic friend group since high school despite his desire to get a respectable job and take part in greater society, can be just as bad as his asshole roommates. Werewolf Jones is a monster. Hanselman's words, not mine. It's akin to women writing to, like, say, Ted Bundy in prison. It's like, why, why would you... Mm. Despite being closeted until his 20s, presumably during his marriage to the elusive Susan, and dealing with personal inadequacy issues, Werewolf Jones has done not only every drug in human existence, but also fucks anything that walks, and is more than willing to exploit his own children for financial gain. Booger is a trans boogeyman who works as a drag queen off-panel, but also lives on welfare just like half their friend group. Mike is a bad influence. Like, he's pretty sus. He still lives with his mom, he's kind of peer pressure -y, and he's more than fine masturbating to security camera footage. Not a guy you want to associate with. These are our primary characters, the ones that involve themselves in every major story beat and have at least one or two notable strips to their names. This cast of eclectic weirdos live in the same small town and get into all sorts of shenanigans like getting drunk and partially destroying a laser tag arena, getting high on their couch and watching How I Met Your Mother, crashing a 13-year-old's birthday party because Owl was convinced for no discernible reason that she was the age of consent, getting high and watching Black Mirror, robbing a local deli because the gang ran out of welfare money, watching a domestic dispute take place in a movie theater parking lot, sexually assaulting Owl on his own birthday, getting high and doing nothing, and gaslighting. This is a New York Times best-selling series, by the by. The comic of Megan Mog is fairly self-aware of how toxic it may seem, how offensive and outright cruel its characters can be. In fact, it actively makes you question whether you like these characters at all or that you just feel bad for them. Their circumstances, what led them to live this sort of life, where they're constantly buying eighths from their friend who never left their hometown, whose two sons literally shit all over their house. That's the thing, though. These people never left their hometown. They made these choices, they stuck together and didn't really change. And if they did change, it's always a case of one step forward, two steps back. Sure, they can blame their problems on being depressed and perpetuate their bad behaviors, because everyone around them is doing it, but that doesn't make it better. Just like a good sitcom, despite having a status quo in the beginning, that status quo is challenged and inevitably changed as time goes on. Meg and Mog and Owl and pretty much everyone grows and changes. They face real-world consequences for their actions despite the extraordinary circumstances they find themselves in, though that's usually due to their own stupidity. Let's not forget about Hanselman's art, because that's the real star of the show. Despite seeming somewhat cartoonish or low effort at first glance, Hanselman's work is incredibly detailed. Accurate anatomy, well-structured backgrounds, precise inking, and when things get trippy, they get trippy. Hanselman has stated numerous times he doesn't use a computer for any of his artwork, which you can see during his Instagram live streams and during episodes on his YouTube channel, Manga Chat. Hell, he says he uses food coloring for some of his works outside of watercolor, which astounds me given some of the spreads in One More Year and Bad Gateway. The fact that Megan Mog is not only consistently on model and well-structured and coherent six to nine panel grids is an achievement for a solo act such as this, especially in the modern age. Now, the reading order. Hanselman has a suggested reading order of One More Year, Megan Mog in Amsterdam, Mega Hex, Bad Gateway, then Seeds and Stems, with the most recent book, Below Ambition, taking place sometime between Amsterdam and Mega Hex. However, I enjoyed reading it in publication order despite being warned not to do so. Mega Hex is both a great entry point into the series as well as a primer for things to come in later books. The only book I would recommend you don't read first is Crisis Zone which was both an experiment in weekly comics by Hanselman, as well as confirmed to be non-canonical given the timeline and... Spoilers, Owl's still living with the gang. Crisis Zone is fucking hilarious though, full of memeable moments and character development you don't see in the main timeline. At least not yet. So don't let the canonicity of the story interfere with your good time, or anything I say really. Megan Mog may play with deeper themes and complex characterization, but it's also just a dark sitcom at the end of the day, like It's Always Sunny or Bojack Horseman. Just more depressing. And nudity. And murder. And sexual assault. 
Megan Mog is ultimately a reflection of both its artist's life and the grim reality of toxic, towny friendships. It's a cruel reminder in a way to avoid stagnation, stopping yourself from falling deeper and deeper into that void addictions form. The reason why I covered this is because, at the end of the day, Megan Mog reminds me of these kinds of people I know. The things they would do, the choices they would make. The choices I made. If I let myself remain stuck in that endless loop of smoking bowls and needless drama between intoxicated, trauma-riddled people, I don't know where I'd be today. So I'm thankful I woke up. I'm thankful I got help. I'm thankful I made a change. Thank you for watching.